So now we're coming to the highlight of the evening. We are. Yeah. Which is the present day, and Bill's going to share some thoughts that are both from his book, which is just an absolutely fabulous book about social movements and a theory of social movements and a handbook for social movements, and some additional thoughts that come out of this and support this that you should have just received in the um, green packets. And I've got some more here if people need those. So this is doing democracy. Doing democracy with Bill Moyer. Instead of just leaping into the book, and talking, which is about how social movements work. Um, my more recent focus, in addition, is what is the place of power and the role of social movements in society? Because usually, we, most people think of social movements as demonstrations and rebels, you know, which is totally not the case. Uh, and so I wanted to talk the first part about the role of power in America. And if you had this packet, it, uh, the first couple of pages, you can just follow the notes, which I wrote out the other day. Uh, and I've been using for some years this model that many different social scientists use. Uh, and it's three, there's three sectors of power in any society. But we're going to focus on the US. And that's the economic sector, the government, and then, of course, the people. And, uh, and I didn't bring his book, but Nicholas, uh, Nicanor Perlos, Shaping Globalization calls it threefolding, and he's written a book and is very central to the Philippines uh, people's movements for the last 20 years. And they can put a couple million people on the streets in 24 hours. Um, but I want to so I'll start with, uh, briefly I'll just I go through the stages of the United States. But so when the United States was founded in 1776 or 1787 and that, that was one of the great breakthroughs of ideology in modern times, it was the beginning of modern times, of the whole idea of government by the people, for the people, and of the people. No other modern country has done that or taken that position. But when you look at, you know, the beginning of the country, a couple years later, say 1800, the economic elites and the government were the same people. <laughs> uh, George Washington, you know, the British took away West Virginia, which was his, you know, his own, and part of Virginia. And John Hancock signed really big. <laughs> he owned 95% uh, of the ships that were going to England and other countries, carrying things. And so he was very upset. But all these founding fathers were pretty much the economic and the government. And they were the same people or their friends. And when you look down at the, the people part, it's all scattered individuals. The 90% outdoor people, the, the uh, power holders called them. And for, of course, for the first 20 years, they weren't allowed to vote. And then eventually, uh, white men could vote, but no uh, women people of color, Indians, etc. And in this country until today, starting with then, we do not have 
economic rights. We have the little political rights which came up from the people of the amendments. That's why they're amendments because the family fathers have no idea of doing them. But uh, so that's 1800. A hundred years later, 1900, the U.S. was just uh, was very similar to a third world country. Uh, the same people and friends, the robber barons and the bankers and all, uh, did the economic and the government. They, you see, we have those two sectors sort of have a, a circle around them because they were together and the, the people didn't really have any power except the vote between the elites like we have now. <laughs> and in the, people, most people in the rural or the urban cities with massive poverty, slums, unemployment, slave wages, poor working conditions, dangerous working conditions, the mines, the children, uh, work, all those children working, and the six and day work week and 10 hour to 12 hour workday was the norm. And there were of course no benefits, no welfare, unemployment checks, pensions, health care. You're kind of on your own. And the people were again scattered and not having their power. Well, this is in the 20th century this is where social movements stepped in, really starting with this, the suffragette movement, mobilizing the women around the right to vote and other issues, uh, all kinds of women's issues. And, and then unions. You know, these were bringing disparate individuals into organizations and in, in, into uh, power groups even and then there was big community organizing held the settlement houses and uh, but what happened here is with all the social movements converted, the people as individuals to what is called civil society. And that's organized people. Then you have some power. If you don't, not organize, there's no uh, power. So uh, I think that this civil society, uh, it was a civil rights movement, anti-Vietnam War, women's, feminists, anti-poverty, environmental, all the different aspects. Save the planet, the peace movement, sustainability, gay and lesbian, disabled, and, and now the anti corporate globalization and the big effort in, started in Seattle. It's created the most important development since government by the people, for the people, and of the people because it's actually making that a reality. And of course, simultaneously, we have increased corporations and the rich and the World Bank, IMF, World WTO. And, uh, and so we still have the same elites in the economic uh, the corporations and the government and the revolving door. We got a lot more information in the past year in the past years about this. So. People didn't used to believe this too much. Uh, okay, and so that's really where we are. And, and uh, the uh, some uh, scientific proof of this sir, is Paul Ray's work. It's on the back of the green. It's cover. on the back of the green cover. Are you from Walla Walla? <laughs> I just repeated what you said. Uh, I don't know, that's a, a TV commercial. Uh, anyway. Uh, 
And what Paul, for 20 years, he's been surveying the American population. And, and he and his partner, Ruth, Sherry Anderson, uh, you know, two years ago, we were what called, called the Cultural Creatives, which is this whole new segment of America from the social movement people to the consciousness movement to all on the alternative sustainability movement. And so he says, and, and then he's just come out last year with this analysis called it, and he calls it the new political compass. And because we have a whole different political array makeup, uh, we, and it's on this chart, you start, start with a little, oh, yeah. And so it's the old left and right on the east-west. And you can see that it's about the left. It's the, you know, the old left, and uh, which is still critical. And, but it's 12% uh, of the population. And then the old right conservatives, 19%. And down the bottom, we have the business conservatives and the economic growth globalization people, which is 14% of the population. And they're kind of one of the power, most powerful groupings and the smallest population group. And then up in the top here is this whole new cultural creatives and the new progressives, which I would think Pretty much everybody in this room is in. And this is a big result from uh, uh, social movements. So that's, uh, that's the first section you're about introduced. You're about 15 minutes in. Okay, good. Oh, <laughs> we're doing better than those other earlier groups. <laughs> <laughs> Which I like. Well, you're telling oh, the truth. Life. You're telling the truth, though. So it's easy. <laughs> and there's nobody to correct you. Touche. <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, and Mary Lou and I are going to do this next section. It's actually. It's actually the book, uh, but we won't be quoting, we'll be talking ourselves. Uh, but what chapters are they? It's chapters four and five, I think. In the book, four, no, three and four. Uh, and so, this is the two basic uh, models of MAP, the Movement Action Plan, which I've been developing and using for 20 years or so, and it, these, these two models are in about 20 languages and used all over the world. And uh, I'm going to do the first one and in five minutes, and then you can read about it in the book. <laughs> but it's, this is uh, critical. Uh, part of the book, which is really based on that. And it is, it's also a book in Chinese and Russian and, and uh, Germany. But, uh, and this first uh, thing is this thing, the four roles. That all social movements need four roles to be played. And the first one is the citizen role. We have to place ourselves in the center of society not on the fringe. And we place ourselves as individuals and as a social movement in the center by claiming the widely held values of democracy, freedom, justice, nonviolence, rule by law, cooperation with the police. And uh, because our number one target is not the power holders, but the ordinary citizens. And so to reach 
the great majority of ordinary citizens, we had to start there. And that's what is so great about uh, Dr. King and Mandela. That's why we know about them, because, in part because they placed themselves in the center. Dr. King always would say, we're here to fulfill the American dream, not to condemn it. And when Mandela got out of prison after 27 years, he could have condemned all the white people, said we're going to have a black revolution, but he said, now we're all going to work together to have a non-racial society. And it brought in all the different races in South Africa, and it shunted out the minority uh, violent people on both sides. But it's not enough to claim the center when especially the power holders that economic and government are violating these widely held values, then people, through our demonstrations and social movements, we have to then stand up and say a loud no. And uh, this is the purpose of demonstrations, is to be nonviolent because it's the only way we reach the majority, through demonstrations, rallies, and civil disobedience, and the target uh, appears, and that's who we do target is the power holders and their institutions. But the real target is in the basic American people. You know, we only, and people get really screwed up, that activists, when they think that they're actually demonstrating and trying to do something, you know, against the, the government or the corporation. That's not our real target. So we don't care what they were, their response is at this point. And there's two purposes. Uh, the first is to put a public spotlight on this problem, the violation by power holders of the widely held values, and to give us a platform to talk to the American people through the media by just being doing demonstrations. Suddenly, we have all this access to the media. And it's not enough to just say no and rebel and resist. We also have to play the third role, the change agent, which is then winning over the great majority of Americans. So we do grassroots organizing and local groups spring up and many of them already existed and they are, we have to redefine the issue in terms of the uh, all, every different segment of society. And that, so this is the change agent, grassroots, educating, winning over the hard front lines work of social activism. And the rebel, as rebels, we are the center of attention, we are the movement. As a change agent, we're nurturers, we're invisible, and we're helping other people be the, uh, the, 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 the social change people. And we also have to come up with alternatives, not just a no, but what is yes. And not only alternatives, but we have to come up with a paradigm shift. What's the bigger world view that's causing all this, and then educate ourselves and the public. Well, it's not enough to, even if we went over 80% of the public, we have to convert this also into new laws and new policies. And so this is the reformer role. And uh, all the reformers can do is cash in on the change agent and the rebel. Sometimes the ineffective reformers think they are the movement. And you can't anyway. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and so they're doing the lobbying, parliamentary, and uh, I call them the coups. Uh, the professional opposition organizations often, and they're in in San Francisco and Sacramento and Washington, and there's a, often a big split between them and the local groups because. Uh, the coups 
of big boards and big funding and they and they begin identifying more with power holders than with the local movement and so there's always a split there and of course the reformers and the rebels often don't like each other um, and part of this model when I train people they all say oh we are all we need all four roles and we need to play it effectively and uh, we need to support each other the last thing I'll say about this is is about the ineffective or what I call the negative rebel and these are like a minority of activists the anti the authoritarian anti-authoritarians <laughs> they're anti-american anti-authority anti-organization structure and rules they self-identify as Milton radicals any means necessary disruptive tactics violence to property and even sometimes to people and all this just turns off the public and uh, so the, this is a, the most dangerous part of social activism and it's for the truly victim behavior when you talk to these folks they're angry and dogmatic and aggressive and, and heel powerless which is really interesting and they're often arrogant and egocentric and uh, but the big one of the big ironies is that the power holders they hate often uh, to under the major strategy for them to undercut people's activism is to be is to be in higher Asian provocateurs and what role do they play and the police and the agent were provocateurs but the negative rebel and so it's a self-contradictory thing there and so many activists and, and the ineffective rebels switch when they recognize this through this model um, there was one other point I and it went right in, in one head and out the other. <laughs> but I, my time is up, I'm sure. Okay, well, I'm going to try to uh, talk about this eight stage model, which you should all have here on the next page, uh, as quickly as I can. I think maybe some of you have seen it before. Um, I'm going to start by talking in the, in the middle. And just to say that this model was developed by Bill for working with people um, in movements who were distressed in various kinds of ways because things were not going the way they anticipated. And so I'm going to start with stage four, which is dramatic nonviolent actions and campaigns, protests aimed at the power holders. As Bill was saying, that's kind of the rebel part of a movement. That's what people often think a social movement is because it's the most publicly visible part of it. And when you really uh, hit the timing right, you get something like a trigger event like the Clamshell Alliance demonstration I talked about where, where suddenly there are, people are copying it all over the country and, and it really takes off. Um, but what is less visible to activists is that there are actually three stages that precede that stage. The first one, um, critical, where you have the problem, stage one, you've got the problem but nobody really knows it's a problem. Stage two, people are beginning to see it's a problem and are working through the traditional institutions, going to hearings, whatnot, trying to make a point, but nothing changes. That's what Bill calls proving the failure of existing institutions. We try to change. And then as that goes on, we get the stage three ripening conditions, which means more people are learning, more activist groups are forming, people are doing small demonstrations, trying different things. It hasn't quite taken off yet. So those things all have to happen before you get to what we um, usually think of as a um, social movement, but that's stage four. Um, then the next, I'm going to skip this one for the moment, the next ones after that, um, we get into what Bill was talking about earlier, that the target, it, while the target is directly the power holders during the protests, actually the idea is to reach the public, and that work goes on during the next stage, 
reaching majority public opinion. That's where the social change agents are out, trying to get more and more people to understand this problem. And as the massive numbers of people begin to understand it, the pressure on the power holders then begins to be pretty substantial. And you can begin to think, okay, change might really happen. Then it takes the success stage, means you actually push it to a final success. You get the law passed, you get the policy changed, you get some new kinds of things uh, in place. And that may take the reformers to do that. And then when, you, when you're successful at that, watch and make sure you don't have any backsliding and start another uh, sub-goal of the movement. So if you've won one, uh, you've, you've uh, integrated lunch counters, then you start on swimming pools. You know? um, the, the stage five up here, which I skipped, perception of failure, that happens when activists think that these protests are going to solve the problem and that because we have a ticket sign in front of the electric company, they should close down their nuclear plant next week. And that that is um, that doesn't usually happen. So people, if they don't understand this model, they get discouraged and can um, feel like the goals of the movement are not going to be successful um, and feel quite despairing. But I don't really want to end on that note, just to <laughs> say <laughs> that uh, that we keep, hopefully people can, once they understand this model, um, the, the, the model helps people who are stuck in that place to see what the next step is that has to happen. And more and more and bigger demonstrations is not necessarily it. Once they can begin to see that and get back on track again, then the possibility of success mounts again. We're moving to the future. Yeah. Now I'm going to say a little bit about the last chapter and its activism in the 21st century. Um, and the larger context. Because if we don't understand the larger context, we're, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's doing tactics without strategy and without a, a larger view. And, uh, and, it, and I have it basically on this chart and the next one, but it's, I now call it, I'm calling it first world prosperity, uh, third world poverty, and the dis total destruction of the planet. And that's the system that we have right now. And if you start on the left and we go clockwise, this is, you'll get you know, the Democrats and Republicans and the American uh, power holders perspective. We have on the left, number one, of uh, the West. And that's, since we're here in the US, I'll just talk about the US. So the US, hey, this, aren't we all lucky to be in the most prosperous, most uh, economic, productive, you know, materialistic country that ever existed? And we have all these wonderful things as uh, from, we're developed, matter of fact. We need about 5% development every year to keep going. And, and so, because we're so wonderful that we want everyone else to be developed, so we, so we look at, at uh, the third world, I don't know, 130 to 50 countries, and so we're talking all about helping the developing countries and sending aid and, and support and services and money capital to, so they can develop. And so then we have in the, you know, all these third world countries, they're developing and have been for 50 years and, uh, and, uh, and having democracy and, and we're helping with that. And then coming from them on the bottom, of course, is uh, world trade. So we're getting uh, resources and agricultural products and much of the clothes we're wearing. Uh, Santa Claus even moved his offices from North Pole to Thailand 
<laughs> in part because right where he was the North Pole, the ice is all melted. It's not the ground for 20 pounds. And I envision a little red hat with a white tussle floating there. But anyway, now that's the ideology. That's what we're told constantly. And the reality is the opposite. And I call it the societal myths and societal secrets. First is the societal myth, now the secret um, perspective. So, and we're going to go counterclockwise to understand this. So, yes, we're the most productive country. All this consum material consumption, cars and airplanes. And the TV ads are all geared to that 20, top 25% to buy more, mostly. Uh, of course, one of the problems is that the United States, uh, this is not sustainable. And we'll talk about that a little later. In order to have all this production and consumption, we need to have massive inputs that we don't pay for from the third world countries. That's for 150 countries or more. We have the extractive natural resources, copper, tin, timber, oil. Oil is a big one, cobalt, bauxite, chromium, gold, silver. All the stuff to make airplanes come from all these countries. And I covered that in the, in the other book, Moving Toward New Society, many years ago. But we don't really pay the oil. We only pay the, the sultans and the you know, the elites there, people and the local people get nothing from the, the, and there's the agricultural products, the cash crops and coffee, tea, fish, cotton, meat, tobacco, and as most of us know, and as Frankie Mortepe has written many times, that the poor countries, the hungry countries are net protein, exporters of protein to the over big countries and especially to us. Then the cheap labor, the assembled, manufactured goods, the Max Pila doors, now all over the third world, we have the slave labor and assembling things, automobiles and clothes. And then surprising to most people, you know, for many, many years, there's much, much more cash flow coming from the poor countries to the U.S. than there is going the other direction. There's lots of research in here, you know, just, and I really covered this in the, some of my other work. And so in order, and so what is the conditions in the third world countries? if? half of their resources and all that are being stolen, then it requires 50% or more poverty. It's a requirement for, from our economic consumption. And of course, if we had, if we had all so many of our land and, and labor stolen, we would rebel. And so every one of these countries, there's rebel groups. And so, in order to keep this, every one of these countries have to be military dictatorships. It's a requirement. It isn't, oh look, there's this the guy and that guy, no. Every country, because it's a requirement to put down the re rebellion by the local people so that they can eat and have their own safe water, etc. So, To keep this going, the U.S. has to militarily support and intervene in all these terrible countries to support the, the uh, military dictatorships. And, uh, and so then back here, that requirement requires 50% or whatever of our national budget to be military. And then we're not doing education, our own uh, local serving the local people. And these uh, nations 
third world nations, they are not the developing countries. They're the never to be developed countries. So always intervene. When, you know, when you hear that, think to yourself or, or tell people, hey, they're the never to be developed countries. Uh, according to the Western style, they need to be decentralized and do their own way. And uh, they're never to be developed countries for three, at least three basic reasons. Let's see if I can remember them. But the first one is, they, they're not reproducing the Western U.S. style of all these free inputs that's down the bottom. They're, they're, they're actually having their, their, their basic uh, economic resources stolen from them. And so they can't, they're not reproducing. They can't develop, and we're only developing because we're taking these resources. Second, they're not, they can't develop, they, to develop Western style, they would need 2,000 fourth world nations to be stealing the resources from to reproduce the U.S. model. And then, of course, the last one is if they did develop according to many studies and the ecological footprint project in Vancouver, it would require five and a half additional planet Earths. And uh, we don't have them right now. Maybe technology will, will bring them. And of course, in the middle, the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO makes this go around. And the big fist of the, in, of the, it's not the invisible hand make this, the big fist of the U.S. military intervention and the support of uh, dictators and their hit squads, their death squads, their um, armies. It's all geared to the local um, people. So, Yes, well, thank you, John. And I'm going to finish this up in five minutes. But, I, but the important thing here, I tell activists, whatever you're working on, keep doing that. Whether it's personal transformation, uh, anti-corporate globalization, local organizing, keep doing that. And learn about the larger, this larger context. Because, and then, and then be fitting in what you're doing. Otherwise, we can, you know, even if we brought all the poor people in, into middle class in America, we're just giving, the, giving them deck chairs on the Titanic. And this system is crashing. And I said this a year ago, and for the last uh, 30 years, and it's, it, 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 it has been crashing, and uh, our way of life is, as we know it, economically and politically, is not going to, you know, it's crashing. Uh, so the last, I think, yeah, this is the last thing which also points us out. And that's the last the little chart. The back page. Yeah. And I make these charts up so, so people can follow it easier, I hope. But this is the history of eras in a nutshell. Hunters and gatherers, you know. And then, and then you can see as they were dying out, a tribal era. And then that was thriving. And then the traditional, what's the traditional years of the nation states and the mainstream religions. And uh, before that was Genghis Khan and the, the Roman Empire. And, the, and, uh, and now, the last 400 years from the Enlightenment, we have the modern era, 
you know, which is way up and so big, and uh, the postmodern. And this is rational materialism, and and uh, you know, rationality. And and now what we we have is that this era is crashing, where you see the modern era uh, heading downward. Sustainable water, land, air. You know, in Australia, I have to wear a hat. You know, where my Australian hats, my lovely hats down there, because of the hole in the ozone. And you get, everybody will get skin cancer, and lots of people do. And all the polar, not the polar ice caps, the polar ice is melting. And uh, not only polar, but in the mountains. The mountains are being destroyed, the global warming, the global climate change. So we have super hot places and super cold and super wild things. And that, that's, it isn't like global warming, it's these things together. The food production is methods are cr crashing as we destroy the uh, arable land and all the different life support systems for humans and our national natural resources and with all this we still have overall increasing poverty and an increasing gap between the rich and poor and all this also requires more war and mass destruction and but what we is promoted here is materialism, market, profit, competition, and without the concern or with this larger system. And so what many of the social movements are doing and people around the world are we're, we're creating the new society that's emerging and ch while challenging the power holders and we're creating a cooperative, peaceful partnership way of being in sustainable uh, new era. And so while the old is crashing, which is also the dominator model, uh, we're, we're building a new way of being. And we have to be doing this at the individual level at our own cultural level, of, in the home, the way we relate to each other, in our groups, and and changing the uh, social systems and institutions into this new way of being. And this is the real wonderful thing to me is that is that we're in this special time of human beings developing it's it's a we've had an evolution and all those big evolutionary you know changes they happen real quickly now they can even happen quicker because we have everything together and what we're doing we just need to change our mentality our mind and and uh, our and bring in our spirituality and our connection to the earth and that line, yes, I added down the bottom. That looks so trouble. And 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 you can see what it is. It's from the very beginning of the hunters and gatherers, where it was a much big spiritual connection with the earth and Gaia. And then, as we went through each of the eras, we got closer and further and further away from our connection 
of spirituality and connection and to uh, down toward materialism and so we need to make a sharp uh, revival and reconnection uh, with the spirit and I think that's all Wherever and however you go.